Jeff Greenfield watches television. We all watch television, but there's a difference. Jeff Greenfield watches television with the eye of a critic, which he is in any number of fields. For Sunday morning, he's going to be television critic and regularly, we suppose, bite the hand that feeds us. Jeff? Charles, I wanted to begin this enterprise by raising a serious, profound question about the nature of television in American society. Like how come when David Banner turns into the Incredible Hulk, his shirt rips completely off his body, but never his pants? Well, on second thought, I decided to wait on that one for a Ford Foundation conference at Aspen and raise a different question with some intriguing answers. How come Carl Malden is always wearing a hat in those American Express commercials? It's no accident, and that's the point. In television commercials, everything counts. When you have 30 seconds to sell a product, and when it costs you minute by minute 15 or 20 times what it costs to make a network TV show, when it will cost you up to $100,000 every time you want to show that ad in the middle of a hit program, everything has to count. So if you're selling traveler's checks, you want a tough, firm image of safety and strength. Well, who played a tough, firm cop on streets of San Francisco? Carl Malden. And who are the only men in America, not counting baseball players and American Legion officials, who wear hats? Right, cops. And that's why Carl Malden's hat is glued to his head. Now, you might try looking for such details when it comes to a centuries-old advertising tradition, the attempt to link a product with sex. Sometimes it's done with a word. Geritol tablets has a youngish man and woman, husband and wife, I suppose, but I'm no snoop, looking at each other with mutual admiration while proclaiming the tablet as potent. They are talking about the pill. Of course they are. Sometimes it's done with smutty slogans. Flick your bick. Get stroked in the morning. I'm going to change your sausage. A kind of commercial version of the smarmy leer of the newlywed games, what did you wish your husband had more of on your wedding night inquiries. Sometimes even a television network yields to temptation. Last fall, CBS's promotion for its new shows promised, turn us on, we'll turn you on. Obviously, one demand of feminism has been heard here. For the second season, CBS boasts, we're coming on. Next fall, I believe the slogan will be, our place or yours. Now, admittedly, close attention to detail is not always necessary. The Noxima company prefers to sell its shaving cream with the subtle as a sledgehammer approach. Take it all off. Let creamy cream you. And of course, Farrah Fawcett dipping her hands into what were called great balls of comfort. Don't write to me, friends. I just report what's going on. Currently, they have given us Auntie Friction, a Victorian porn queen who materializes in a man's bathroom, rips off her clothes, and does a routine from a topless bar. It's so blatant that one network, this one, won't clear it for broadcast. But if you want sexual subtlety with a vengeance, take a look at this commercial for Rise, which begins with a woman and her paramour surprised by the man of the house. Oh no, he's home! A kiss goodbye? He wants you a kiss, go, but his beard's too beard. tough. It's He'll rock. shave fast with Rise. No Into time. the bathroom, they flee as the threatening rise. figure of the man of the house rise comes ever closer. Who is no this time. punishing figure now moving up the See? stairs to the bathroom? We will soon shave. find out the answer to this provocative so question. So quick. Father, how about a close shave? Her father? Good heavens, illicit love, flight to the bathroom, and just a hint of S&M and incest all in 30 seconds and it isn't even on public television. Well, the big television show of the year has already been on, commercials and all, the Super Bowl game, 35 to 31 Pittsburgh. That was a week ago, but the memory lingers among those who still have to pay off their bets. Ray Gandalf's subject this morning is big money betting. Charles, the amount of money bet on Super Bowl 13 has been estimated as high as two billion dollars. And if only half the people who watched the game on television had a bet down, and the average bet was $50, there's your two billion right there. And as you'll see in a moment, those figures don't seem out of line at all. There's a tune called the football card, sung by Glenn Sutton, that's a big hit with bettors, who listened with us and told us that's the way it is. Well, the gambling bug bit a lot of men, but what it's done to me is a rotten sin. I bet myself clean out of house and home. 
Cause there ain't nothing this side of hell Like trying to pick a winner in the NFL Especially when your luck is going wrong Much more money is bet on the Super Bowl game Than on any other single sporting event A seven game World Series might come close Football <laughs> I hate it No, I love it Operating out of the Stardust Hotel in Las Vegas and accepting any bet up to a half million dollars is the country's biggest legal bookie, Joey Boston. We opened this uh, betting parlor in 75, so the first Super Bowl game would be 76. We handled a million two. This is all cash business, no credit. This is cash over the counter. And the following year, the 77 game, we handled a million five. Last year, I was hoping to, that we, we would handle two million. We handled two million two. What's the biggest uh, wager you've had so far uh, if somebody wanted to bet on a Super Bowl? I I've mean, already taken three $100,000 bets. You mean people walk up to you at 100000 Cash. And they want to bet? Cash. 34 one, one to win 31. You've got 34,100. Oh, what I do? Yeah, yeah. Cowboys. What I want. Yeah. 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 No, no, that's kind of bad. Okay, $10? Okay. I was on the job and working hard when a man come along with this football card and said, Try your luck, boy. All your friends have won. In Miami last so Sunday, at least a couple of hundred people, too, some of whom had tickets to the game, like chose to watch it on television at the Bowl Bar across the street. It was like trying to read Shakespeare in a discotheque. There were no $34,000 bettors here, but they were all bettors. How much did you put on it? Uh, one. Miami Bulls. Just one. I got $500 going. Offhand, maybe. Five, six hundred. How much money? My How whole much? life. The Cardinals took my savings account, and the Redskins got a similar amount that I borrowed from a finance company on a 90-day note. Every year, the betting does increase. There's more interest, more women bet. Uh, television has made it what it is. Uh, the Super Bowl is undoubtedly the biggest betting event in the United States as far as sports goes. Bob Martin's betting shop in the Union Plaza Hotel is much more modest than Joey Boston's, but Bob Martin is the guru who figures out the point spread every week and whose number is considered the official line. The point spread is not a reflection of how much better one team is than another. It's designed to attract roughly equal betting on both teams, and it's how Martin thinks the public will bet that really sets the line. The Steelers captured the fancy of the public they just overwhelmed everybody. So we came to the conclusion that the general public would bet on the Steelers. So we opened them here at the Union Plaza at three points. Meanwhile, back at the Bowl Bar, a Pittsburgh better who had given four and a half points thought he was home free in the fourth quarter when the Steelers led 35 to 17. We asked the man who puts out the gold sheet, circulation 28,000, why people bet. Among people who attended our seminars around the country, we, we had questionnaires. And the five most prevalent reasons given for why people bet, one, desire to prove superiority involving forces of chance. Two and three was a tie between the intellectual exercise and the desire for the acquisition of unearned money. Four was the inexplicable excitement provided, and far behind those top four uh, was greed. Well, I lost my furniture on a Denver bet, and Oakland got my new Corvette, and the Rams are the reason I cashed them five hot checks. Football, it, it uh, I don't know, what do you call it, the, the adrenaline throw, uh, runs through me. I get peaked up during the week, and I head for the weekend, and I'm, I'm getting sky high. Without doing anything, I'm getting sky high, looking forward to the weekend. And then it takes me a couple of days to drain. It just brings something out in the uh, American people, the, uh, the Super Bowl. And it's a proven factor by the money. I, I really believe it's the American way. enough to make a grown man sit and cry. 
When Roger Staubach moved the Dallas Cowboys to two late touchdowns, matching the four-point spread, it was, quote, a disaster for Mr. Boston and for many bookies, and for the fellow in the bar who had given four and a half. But Glenn Sutton could have told them all about Roger Staubach. Then Dallas put me in a hell of a fix. I gave up seven, they won by six. You'd think that Staubach personally hated me. Well, the Pittsburgh Steelers left no choice but for my poor wife to file for divorce on the simple grounds of football cruelty. It's a world in motion this morning. The Pope in Mexico, Deng Xiaoping, on his way to the United States. The embattled Prime Minister of Iran trying to save his country from chaos with a planned trip to Paris. We've assembled some of our CBS News correspondents. Bernard Kalb in Washington, where he has recently returned from China. Moscow correspondent Bernard Redmonts in London, where he's just flown in from the Soviet Union. And before it's all over, we may get Dick Threlkeld in Mexico City in on this, too. Together, we're going to try to put today's blur of motion into focus. Uh, Bernard Redmond, uh, can you tell me uh, what the Russian view of this uh, trip of the deputy premier of China to the United States is? Uh, are they worried about it? Are they angry about it? They certainly are, Charles. Uh, nobody's going to be watching this visit more than Brezhnev and his high command in the Kremlin. They're extremely concerned about the warm-up between the United States and China. Uh, Brezhnev deliberately delayed his planned trip to the United States and the conclusion of the SALT agreement because he didn't want to be upstaged by the visit of the Chinese leader. And he's been carrying on a diplomatic campaign to try to block the supply of weapons to China by Western powers. The Soviet news media have been calling China the uh, eastern branch of the Western NATO alliance. That shows a good deal of concern. Uh, the Russians have an enormous number of troops, some say up to one million on the border with China, a 4,000 mile border. And uh, the Chinese themselves have about half their army on that border. So there's no love lost between the two superpowers on the communist side. Uh, Bernie Kelb, you've just come back from uh, China. Uh, I suppose Deng Xiaoping doesn't think of himself as part of the Western alliance quite yet. But uh, what does he expect to get out of this visit to the US? Well, Charles, Deng Xiaoping is coming here for a whole roster of reasons. But one of the things he would like is access to Western and American technology. And also, he likes the idea of there being some sort of togetherness between Peking and Washington, because it affects the nervous system of the Kremlin. As Bernie Redmond just told you, if that assessment is true, that the Kremlin is upset and angry about this visit, that is absolute music to the ears of Deng Xiaoping, certainly, and I would imagine to the Carter administration, but the Carter administration plays that very, very low key, insisting that it is not playing the China card against the Russians. Uh, it seems to me the United States is in a pretty good position here, uh, being courted by the Chinese. Uh, Bernard Redmond, the Russians may not like it, but what can they do about it? Well, they really can't do too much about it. They have some possible cards to play, but most of them are unlikely. Uh, they could try a warm-up with Taiwan, for example. Uh, the Russians have a link with uh, Chang's son, uh, who uh, married a, a Russian. And uh, that could be one possibility, but it seems rather unlikely. Uh, they could also change their policy toward China. Uh, Brezhnev himself warned the United States to think twice about trying to play off Moscow and Peking. He said, if you put two bears in a ring, why, they might not fight each other. They may turn on you. Now, that seems unlikely, but it's a possibility. Charlie, I think one of the more interesting scenarios in the long run, certainly, is a rapprochement once again between Peking and Moscow. It seems inconceivable from their strategic point of view for them to be at odds at each other and give the United States the opportunity, even the opportunity, of playing one off against the other. 
I am certain, as many strategists and as many analysts of the China watching scene are, that there is a constant ongoing debate in Peking about whether to make up with the Russians once again, certainly in the long range. Um, Dick Threlkeld, uh, there in Mexico City, we, we don't want to end this discussion without asking you uh, just this one question. Doesn't it take a kind of reckless courage for that other traveler of the day, the Pope, to make the trip he's made? Isn't he putting himself in a dangerous situation for the church down there? Well, Charlie, hearing all you fellows talk about the, the great powers of the world, it struck me uh, something that Joseph Stalin said years ago, contemptuously asking, how many divisions of soldiers does the Pope have? Well, in fact, if you look around and you've seen the pictures here, he has legions. Uh, he, is a, he is a great leader. Uh, no secular statesman could have drawn the people he has drawn. So I think it puts to rest the argument that he's just a religious leader. People like Brezhnev, Deng Xiaoping, and Jimmy Carter are going to have to consider Pope John Paul II as one of their own. Next week, we're going to uh, schedule a few more minutes for this uh, discussion at the end of our broadcast. For now, I have to thank you, Dick Threlkeld, and Bernard Kalb, Bernard Redmont. Thank you all for spending part of your Sunday with us, and good morning to you. An advertisement I saw for this broadcast called it the Sunday newspaper that comes in a tube. Well, most of us around here used to work on newspapers, so that's a comparison we gladly accept. But now you've seen the first edition of Sunday Morning, and you know it's not quite true. We're a television program, a little more leisurely and experimental than most, we hope, but a news broadcast after all. Eric Severide, a good writer, when he was feeling grumpy about television, used to murmur, one good word is worth a thousand pictures. We're going to choose our words at least as carefully as our pictures on Sunday morning. If they're going to call us an electronic newspaper, we want to be a good one. We wanted you to know what we're doing around here. After this, we won't be so introspective. We'll just do it. I'm Charles Kiralt. See you next Sunday morning. For the news of the day ahead, watch the CBS Evening News with Morton Dean tonight.